Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, the title of today's webinar is Geohazard Considerations for Resilience and Climate Change Mitigation. Uh, my name is Sean van Balagoy. I'm an expertise director uh, for the Geotechnical Group at Tonkin & Taylor. Uh, and I'm Eric Bird. I'm an engineering geologist in the Geotechnical Group at Tonkin & Taylor as well. Hello, I'm Marge Russ, so I specialise in environmental planning and uh, have done a lot of work in the natural hazards area. Back to Short. Thank you. Right, so for today's topics, uh, we're going to sort of look at the effects of climate change on geohazards, and the need for change in geotechnical practice to support good decision making, i.e. How, how do we adapt to uh, our climate change? Eric's then going to talk about housing resilience and carbon and whether there's a trade-off between mitigation and adaptation. And then Marge is going to wrap this uh, series up with a uh, looking at the role of New Zealand's regulatory environment in enabling climate change adaptation and mitigation. Right, so uh, just to kick this up, off for the first part, uh, the effects of climate change on geohazards. Particularly, I'll be looking at, you know, uh, presenting the, the, the case for a need for change in geotechnical practice to help enable support for decision making. In my first bit, I'm going to first present the linkage between climate change and geohazards. I will not be discussing the oceanographic or atmospheric or hydrological effects, such as in the images below. I'll be focusing on geohazards and we'll provide some examples such as uh, shrink swell and the effects that that has on the built environment and how climate change will affect that. The effects of liquefaction you know, from, from earthquakes and how climate change will impact that. We'll talk about the impacts of uh, these geohazards on the built environment. And then I'll finally wrap it up with the need for change in geotechnical practice to support good decision making. So looking at the linkage between climate change and geohazards, climate change amongst other things will result in a rise in sea level, changes in rainfall patterns, higher intensities in some areas, wetter in some areas, drier in some areas and higher temperatures. All those things will result in changes in groundwater. This will result in changes in the geohazards, generally increasing them. And that will impact the built environment. This, has re uh, this results in adverse and social environmental impacts. Rises in sea level will increase groundwater levels. Increases in groundwater levels and uh, you know near coastal areas increases the liquefaction severity. It can affect the gravity drainage of pipe networks by submerging them and resulting in increased inflows. The increased inflows into basements and land behind stop banks will also occur as a result of rising groundwater levels, which means that you know pumped systems will need to increase the pumping or uh, you know, buildings that have been designed as tank systems will get increased pressures on them. Changes in rainfall intensity, particularly where rainfall intensities can increase, will result in increases in stream and river flows, resulting in more scour, changes of sediment budgets, resulting in erosion and aggregation, which then changes the flooding aspects as well. So it's not just increasing flooding, but also changing the geohazards that associate with that, which then have a further effect on the flooding. Changes in rainfall intensities uh, will also increase temporal groundwater pressures, increasing slope stability uh, or instability, such as landsliding. And, uh, you know, areas that become wetter or areas that become drier and higher temperatures 
will result in changes in soil moisture, increasing soil shrink swell issues. So let's take a look at the soil shrink swell geohazard example. And we'll look at the effects of longer and more intense dry spells, what that will do. Uh, sh soil shrink swell in the built environment causes the ground surface to go up and down. Uh, when we build with ordinary buildings in such environments where uh, account isn't being properly taken for for how the um, land moves up and down or you know with just using standard building foundations can for example see a lot of cracking uh, occur into houses and the more that the ground moves up and down the more cracking that can occur. Soil shrink swell is influenced by soil type and thickness and we can't do much about that that's just what it is. Uh, the soils and uh, areas in Auckland and Northland and New Zealand, uh, it, the soils have a great propensity to shrink and swell. But the other part that it, that it is influenced by is the depth of penetration of moisture changes from dry spells. The shorter the dry spell, the less of the distance of depth of penetration, and therefore that you know, limits the amount that the ground surface moves up and down. Uh, the longer the dry spells are, uh, you know, the, the warmer the temperatures, the um, more, uh, the, the greater the depth of penetration below the ground surface for where there will be uh, changes in moisture content. And that can influence the, uh, you know, the amount of shrink swell. So in New Zealand, our foundations for thousands of residential houses and other lightweight structures are designed in accordance with AS uh, 2870. It's based on a shrink swell index, and it, you know that shrink swell index is used to calculate soil movement, uh, and that enables the placement of soils to be in a particular class under uh, AS uh, AS two eight seven zero. So we can see a sort of formula there. I won't get into the maths of that, but effectively uh, YS is the amount that the ground surface is predicted to sort of go up and down. And the bigger the number that we can see in the table, so if we get sort of 20 millimeters predicted, we've got a site that's slightly reactive. If we've got 70 millimeters that's predicted, we've got a site that's extremely reactive. Uh, the higher the classification of the site, the more robust a foundation system will need to be to protect uh, a house or a building from damage. Now, when we start thinking about climate change and we look at the predicted uh, you know, increase in uh, dry spells, and uh, the image on the right there, uh, on the left, uh, indicates you know, some of the areas that are predicted to become uh, drier or have longer dry spells. The suggested depths of change of moisture content uh, for wet coastal alpine areas is only 1.5, whereas when we go to semi-arid areas, that becomes a value of three. So we literally double our depth of penetration. So climate change, uh, you know, where we get more severe droughts and more common, will increase the depth of moisture content and can, for example, in areas of Auckland and Northland, uh, move us down a couple of notches on these tables if we take climate change into consideration. And so what that means is when we look at where we end up on this table, the great depth of inner penetration of changes in moisture content, i.e. the ground drying up, uh, it will increase the uh, amount of ground surface movement uh, particularly in the Northland and Auckland areas where the soils are most susceptible to going up and down. While other areas of the country uh, may become, uh, you know, also be subject to long dry spells, if they, have the, if they don't have the soils there that um, react, then while the climate change hazard is there, it doesn't result in an associated geohazard. But for the Auckland and Northland areas, it's likely to. Now we can have a look at look faction. 
And I'll use Christchurch as an example, given that it is such an excellent uh, test case and the earthquakes that have occurred have given us a significant insight. So if we look at Christchurch and the look faction hazard, we can first need to start considering the changes that are expected to occur to groundwater. The map on the left shows the depths to, ground, uh, depths to groundwater or the groundwater model for the Christchurch area. It's an extensively detailed model based on lots of investigations post the uh, Christchurch earthquakes uh, and that model was built to support the reconstruction effort. The darker the colours, uh, the shallower the groundwater is. So the dark, darker blue groundwater is typically half a metre below the ground surface. The lighter blue, it's 1 to 1.5 metres below the ground surface. And then when we get to sort of the greens, that's 2 to 2.5 metres below the ground surface. So Christchurch is a low-lying coastal plain. Uh, and so the graph in the middle, uh, the orange dotted line, shows the riverbed of the Avon River. And the black line that we can see uh, on that graph uh, shows the current mean sea level and mean river level up the Avon River. When we started looking at the effects of sea level rise, it becomes apparent that as, as the sea level rises, so will the river level. The river level will come up, but only up to a certain point. So in the lower reaches of the river, all the way back to point A on the map, half a metre of sea level rise will come all the way back, right back to the CBD. And then if we have a metre of sea level rise, that comes back a little bit further. The same, we looked at the same, uh, did the same exercise for all the other rivers in Christchurch, the Waimakariri River, the Styx River, the Heathcote River. And on the map on the left, we have demarked all the locations A, you know, with point A and point B, how far back we are expecting uh, half a metre and a metre of sea level rise to have their effects as, as a backwater effect up the rivers. Which means downstream from those points, uh, we would expect the river levels to rise and therefore the groundwater levels to rise. And that's what we're showing on the maps on the right. Uh, the top top map on the right shows uh, the expected increase in groundwater uh, uh, increase depth and in, sorry the increase in groundwater, i.e., how much more shallow it becomes, uh, from half a meter of sea level rise for the top graph or top map, and one meter of sea level rise for the bottom one. Having established what is a likely change in groundwater. Uh, level as a response to sea level rise, we can now have a look at the effects on lip faction. Using the extensive uh, geotechnical database, we were then able to model the lick faction geohazard for 25 year return period levels of shaking, which is the left hand column of maps and graphs, 100 year return period levels of earthquake shaking which is the central column of maps and graphs, and 500 year return period levels of shaking. The maps, uh, the colors on the maps indicate the severity of predicted liquefaction. Lighter gray colors mean that liquefaction isn't predicted. And when it's um, orange and sort of darker reddy colors, that's when moderate to severe liquefaction is predicted. A quick glance at those maps and we can see for the top row, no sea level rise at relatively small levels, of more frequent return periods, levels of shaking. We only expect liquefaction to occur in isolated uh, you know, pockets in Christchurch. Obviously, with as the shaking intensity increases for larger return period events going across the top row to the top right, we see that the predicted liquefaction becomes more extensive and severe as what, we, as what was observed in the uh, Canterbury earthquake sequence. Now the middle row of graphs shows how the liquefaction hazard for those different return periods is expected to change where, with half a meter of sea level rise. And the bottom row of graph, uh, the bottom row of maps for a meter of sea level rise. What becomes obvious 
when we then scan down the page, is that for both more frequent return period events, as well as the larger return period event earthquakes, the lick faction hazard is increasing and becoming more severe and more extensive. The graphs on the bottom show the percentage of urban flatland um, that is affected by lick faction. Blue is where it isn't affected. Green is where the lick faction effects are minor to moderate, and then red is moderate to severe. For the 25-year return period earthquake event, we can see the predicted um, lick faction is like, uh, or the moderate severe is quite small. And then we can see how the dark red sort of component uh, grows with the increasing sea level rise. And we can see that across all the different return period earthquake events. So if we just focus on the moderate severe lick faction, and I've got some photos there to show what moderate severe lick faction impacts actually mean on the built environment. For 25 year return period earthquakes, based on today's groundwater levels, less than 10% of the urban area in Christchurch would be affected. But after, you know, after the point at which we've got one meter of sea level rise, the lick faction hazard will have increased such that 30% of the urban area is likely to be affected by moderate severe lick faction. So sea level rise has a significant impact on uh, the lick faction hazard. Similarly, we can see for a 500 euro turn period event, uh, currently, with today's groundwater levels, 40% of the urban area of Christchurch would be affected. But after a metre of sea level rise has occurred, uh, with a repeat 500 year return period event, 70% of urban Christchurch would be affected. Some people may ask, you know, an increasing look faction geohazard, is that a reality or a theory? Well, the Canterbury earthquake sequence gives us some wonderful insights uh, that, that help test uh, whether this is theory or reality. The map that's shown here is uh, you know, of the Bexley area in Christchurch and shows the subsidence that occurred as a result of the lick faction from the earthquake events that occurred. The areas in pink, dark pink, show where there has been more than a meter of ground surface subsidence. The areas in yellow is where there's been only you know, 100 to 200 millimeters of ground surface subsidence as a result of the earthquakes. This map here shows the elevation before the earthquakes. And we see that sort of the Bexley area, uh, the northern part of the Bexley area is in a light blue color, one to two meters above sea level, uh, mean sea level. Post earthquake, we can see that the Bexley uh, area is now a half a meter above mean sea level. So it has considerably dropped. Now, whether sea levels come up or the ground surface has dropped, the effects are, you know, would be the same. When the ground surface drops, the groundwater, the, the, the current groundwater will be closer to the ground surface. And that's what we saw in the Bexley area in Christchurch was that the ground depths to groundwater used to be uh, one and a half meters uh, below the ground surface. At the end of the sequence, it was only half a meter below the ground surface. So the ground surface subsidence that occurred has caused the groundwater to become shallower. Similarly, climate change will raise sea levels, which will raise groundwater levels, which will decrease the depth to the ground surface. So what did we see in Christchurch? And uh, this, this will just demonstrate. The, uh, here we just have a simple house on a soil profile. Uh, the blue dotted line is the groundwater level. Above there, the ground doesn't liquefy. Below there, the ground can liquefy if the shaking is strong enough. The effects of change uh, depth of the groundwater are really important here. So if we get the September earthquake coming along, uh, you know, and it was strong enough to liquefy the soil beneath, then uh, we can get a lot of sand coming up out of the ground. The ground surface settles. 
and the building settles as well, and there's some differential settlement damaging buildings. Uh, after the earthquake's been, the soil reconsolidates, regains its strength. The, um, all the liquefaction that's out on the streets and around the properties is all removed. The ground surface is now a bit thinner, uh, a bit lower. So relatively, the groundwater surface is closer to the ground surface. While the groundwater level itself didn't change because the ground surface went down, uh, it is now closer. And as a result, there is a thinner non-liquefying crust. We saw the February earthquake come along. It was strong enough to liquefy the underlying soil. But this time, because of a thinner crust, a lot more sand came out, uh, you know, liquefaction came out. And because the crust was thinner, the houses started to punch through and settle into the ground a lot more. So the damage that we saw and the impacts from liquefaction started to become uh, significantly greater uh, well, the impacts that earthquakes were having was significantly greater as a result of a thinner non-liquefying crust or the groundwater being closer to the ground surface. Once again, the, uh, the soil regained its strength and uh, the sand was all removed, but we can see now that we have a much thinner crust. Now, if climate change occurs and sea level rise, uh, you know, sea levels rise, that groundwater will come up thinning the crust even further. And so effectively what was happening in Christchurch was reducing depth to groundwater, resulting in the reduction of that non-liquefying crust. And the graph on the bottom indicates uh, the horizontal axes is the thickness of the non-liquefying crust, the vertical axis is the thickness of the liquefying layers. And when we plot on the um, upper side of the curve, there's a lot of liquefaction induced damage. When we plot on the other side of the curve, on the right hand side of the curve, there is no liquefaction damage. So clearly, as the uh, crust thickness, uh, as, as the ground groundwater comes closer to the ground surface, there's a reduction in the thickness of the non-liquefying crust, increasing the vulnerability to liquefaction and the, pro the propensity for damage to liquefaction. So though I've just taken you through two examples. The implications to the built environment for groundwater. Groundwater is everything for ge geotechnical engineering. Soil moisture and, uh, and groundwater and groundwater pressures are fundamental to things such as consolidation, settlement, liquefaction, seepage, retaining walls, slope stability, foundations. The largest proportion of geotechnical failures are associated with groundwater issues. And as geotechnical professionals, we do need to pay more attention to groundwater. Climate change will affect groundwater and therefore we need to think carefully about what we use in our assessment and design procedures. Is it appropriate to simply use the values that we measure in the field today? Let's just think about that a bit further. For a building consent, typically for a residential house or for most buildings, the design life is 50 years. So should we be taking climate change into account when assessing the geohazards? And if so, for what time frame? If we use current day groundwater uh, levels, are we being, you know, do we, are we unconservative? What about if we use the end point? Is that too conservative? What about the midpoint? Maybe, you know, maybe sort of what we expect in 25 years from now or a mean risk? Let me demonstrate by an example. For, if we take the shrink swell uh, example that we worked through first, a building today uh, at a particular site uh, may be assessed as having a, be, as being moderately reactive and therefore only require a 3604 type of building foundation system. And that would sort of satisfy the building consent requirements. However, by the year 2070, as the effects of uh, you know, climate change are becoming more pronounced with more frequent and more severe uh, droughts, deeper uh, or the um, classification of, uh, you know, might, uh, is likely to increase uh, to become highly reactive for a particular site. 
In that case, we would need deeper and more heavily reinforced foundation systems. So if we had only built with a 3604 type of foundation, ignoring the effects of climate change, then we'd expect a lot more damage to our buildings in the future. So what should, we be, what should we be building with? What should we be designing for? Similarly, with lick faction, on the vertical axes of the little graph that I've put up there is the lick faction index, calculated index, and the horizontal axes show the rise in groundwater. And so uh, we sort of start off with a certain lick faction hazard and show how that uh, index and show how that is increasing as a function of increasing uh, rise in groundwater level. I've also indicated on there for you know the types of foundation systems that might be necessary, TC2 being the more moderate type of foundation system, right through to a TC3 type of foundation system, which is quite robust, uses a lot of concrete and steel to keep a building satisfactorily together and prevent it from getting uh, significantly damaged. So if we start in the year 2020 and use today's groundwater levels, we might conclude you know, for building consent purposes, we only need a TC2 type of foundation. If we take 20, uh, the predicted groundwater levels uh, you know, uh, in the year 2070, you know, which would be the end of a 50 year design life, uh, we would actually conclude that we might need TC3 type of foundation systems. Or if we take some type of midpoint, maybe we need some type of hybrid foundation system. What this clearly demonstrates is that we do need to think about the um, groundwater levels we take, and that will have an implication to uh, the types of geotechnical engineering designs we'll come up with. But what we should be taking, there is no guidance on that. So we really need to be thinking about that and incorporating that into what we do. But let's now think about a resource consent for a new subdivision. And by you know, resource consent for a new subdivision is not just for 50 years. It's the establishment of a new community. It's design life. Well, the establishment of a new community is in perpetuity. So maybe a thousand years, maybe longer. Should we be taking climate change into account when assessing the geo geohazards? And what time frames? Probably a lot longer than the time frames we'd consider for building consents. So just to wrap up my part, climate change will result in changes to groundwater. This results in changes to the geohazards. It will mainly increase them. Current geotechnical practice, including what is written in our codes and guidelines for assessment of geohazards uh, for resource consents and building consents is typically based on current groundwater conditions and does not factor in climate change effects. This will result in lower future resilience and poorer than expected performance of the built environment than what was consented for. The effects of climate change on geohazards needs to be evaluated to inform better decision making. And uh, Marge will pick up on this a bit later. Now I'm gonna hand over to Eric. Thank you. Thanks, Short. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, uh, Sean's taken us through uh, geohazards, and now I'm going to have a look at specifically how one particular geohazard actually affects um, the built environment by looking at housing resilience and the embodied carbon in our houses. So some time ago, um, just recently, MB introduced a program uh, called Building for Climate Change. And part of the intent of that is to start uh, encouraging designers um, and, and builders to think about how much carbon is going into our buildings, both from a operational carbon perspective, i.e. how much carbon the, the building costs to run, heating, cooling, all of those other operational things, but also from an embodied carbon perspective. So thinking about how much carbon we're actually putting in uh, to our buildings, the materials we're using, how we're using those materials, the types of construction um, that we are actually building. The benefit of that approach is it means that eventually um, carbon and embodied carbon in building becomes um, something we think about as we design a building the same way we think about health and safety and we think about structural performance and amenity and sustainability and some of those other things that we think about when we build 
one of the challenges is once we start thinking about embodied carbon in buildings, we now need to think about the whole life cycle of the building, starting from um, extraction and manufacture of the materials through to eventual decommissioning uh, and demolition of that building, because buildings don't last forever, sort of like, like Sean alluded to. They come to the end of their life and we have to demolish them. Now, it'd be nice to think that we live in an environment where maybe we could start to recycle all of the pieces of our buildings. The problem is when we get a large natural disaster like an earthquake, that opportunity isn't really afforded to us. All of the other pressures that come into play in the aftermath of a large earthquake mean that we're essentially just demolishing our houses and sending them to landfill. That represents a massive carbon emission. So I'm going to talk about embodied carbon um, as it relates to housing um, and the geohazard of liquefaction. So there are a couple of key decisions that we make uh, when we think about housing. The first is where we build it, and the second is what we build. Where we build is governed by um, land use planning, land use decisions. The land that we have available to us, um, our priorities around where we build. Some of those decisions mean that we build on liquefaction prone land. Um, sometimes we have the luxury of choosing between liquefaction prone land and, and not, um, but that's a really significant decision because it has quite um, wide ranging implications in terms of carbon emissions. And then once we've decided where we're going to build, um, what we build, the attributes of what we actually build is important. The size, the shape, the foundation types, the building materials that we use um, are important. And they're important in two ways. One is all of those things have an associated carbon um, cost. They have embodied carbon in them. We could choose to use low carbon products or we can choose to use high carbon products. But as well as having a certain amount of embodied carbon, they have a certain level of resilience. Certain sizes, shapes, foundation types, building materials have a higher level of resilience um, than other types. And so I'm going to dive down into that particular challenge as well. So first of all, where we build matters. Um, what I'm about to show you comes from a piece of work we've been carrying out for EQC. So I just want to acknowledge EQC as our clients here who have, who have funded this work. Um, and what we've done is taken all of the insurance, that residential insurance claims data sets for Christchurch and Kaikoura and run a bunch of analysis on those in order to um, understand how buildings perform um, and how various types of land perform and, and the interactions between those. On the left, what we're looking at is the number of residential building claims just expressed as a proportion of the overall total um, expressed on the bottom axis um, by building damage ratio. So you can think of building damage ratio just as how badly damaged a building is. 0 to 20 percent is relatively light damage, um, over 50 percent is relatively significant damage. On the right hand side, we're looking at the financial losses, not the number of claims, but the, the total dollar value of those claims. And again, expressed by the level of damage in a building. And you can see those two graphs essentially look almost like opposites. So what's going on there? Well, pick a couple of lines on these graphs and you'll see what's happening. That black dotted line represents shaking claims. Um, what that means is this is land that didn't see liquefaction. It was just shaking. All they saw was earthquake shaking. And what you can see there is around 85% of our claims were just shaking damage claims. And the vast majority of those claims sit down the far end on the left um, as relatively lightly damaged buildings. On the right, that represents about 45% of our losses. These repairs aren't a particularly carbon intensive exercise. It's mostly painting and plastering and fixing cracks. The other piece that we're not thinking about that I'm now highlighting in red is our liquefaction damage. So that represents about 15% of our claims, but over 50% of our losses. And you can see that all of those claims are now stacked down the far end in the large uh, damage ratio column. So what that means is that when we get liquefaction, we start to get much more significant damage. Um, the vast majority of those losses there rep uh, actually um, represents rebuilds. So houses that were damaged beyond economic repair um, got demolished and got thrown in landfill. So that column on the right hand graph uh, represents a large carbon emission. It's tens of thousands of houses get knocked over and sent to a landfill. So if we build on liquefiable land versus flat land, has massive implications in terms of our carbon emissions. 
And secondly, what we build matters. So there's a whole bunch of physical characteristics of housing um, that materially influence the way that housing performs. Things like the floor area of a house, the foundation type of a house, the shape of a house, all of those things have an associated carbon cost, I guess, um, but they also have quite significant implications when we do get liquefaction on how that house performs. So you can see a couple of modern houses in this picture here um, with a whole bunch of liquefaction on the ground. Those houses have just disappeared into the ground. So I'm going to show you a complex series of graphs. Don't worry about the squiggly lines in the background. That's just the, the raw data. So what we've done is taken all of our insurance claims data and plotted it up to see what are the things that affect the way that a building performs, um, that affect the way whether a house performs well or a house performs poorly. Let me just quickly explain this graph because graph because I'm going to show you a bunch more. Um, on the vertical axis, we have the rebuild proportion. So this is the proportion of houses um, that need to be rebuilt as a result of liquefaction damage. Uh, on the bottom axis, on the horizontal, uh, we've got that liquefaction scale that Sean briefly talked about before. Um, that liquefaction scale ranges from none to minor through to moderate to severe. So for reference, let me show you what none to minor generally looks like. Uh, it's some undulations in your lawn and maybe a few cracks in your concrete patios. Not much going on. The minor to moderate class in the middle there, um, we're starting to see liquefaction at the ground surface. We're starting to see a little bit of uh, tilt in buildings. We're starting to see a little bit of foundation and cladding damage in some of our more sensitive structures. Um, you can't miss it, uh, but it's not overwhelming by any stretch. And in that moderate to, to severe category, um, this is where we're really starting to see everything kicking off. So in Christchurch, these are the areas that we would typically have either red zoned or classified as TC3. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of liquefaction ejector. There's a lot of quite substantial building damage. Um, and it's all pretty obvious. So that's what that bottom axis on this graph means. Now if I flip back to that graph, we can have a look at the pattern of damage that actually occurs. The black line second from the bottom is the average of all of our buildings. But then in order to understand um, the way that buildings actually perform and, and what some of these attributes, how, how these attributes affect the way buildings perform, we've taken those that full package of buildings and split it out based on various attributes. So what I've done here is taken all of our buildings and split them out based on floor area. You can see the orange line at the bottom is our small buildings, 0 to 120 square metres. The purple line at the top is our large buildings, over 240 square metres. And you can see almost immediately that you pay a large penalty for having a big building. If you have a small house, even at the really severe end of liquefaction performance, only about 50% of those houses end up in landfill, as opposed to 90% of our large houses ending up in landfill. So they pay kind of two penalties there. A large house is less resilient, uh, but it also has a whole lot more carbon in it. So every time we write off a large house, the carbon emissions associated with that are significantly higher than every time we do for a small house. Building shape is also important. Don't, don't worry too much about the, um, the bottom axis there. That's just describing the way we've calculated building regularity. Um, Think about light blue, uh, light green um, is squares and rectangles, and purple and blue are much more complicated buildings. These are these are buildings taken straight from the starter set that we're playing with. Plotted on the same graph, you can see that if a building is a regular shape, i.e. a square or a rectangle, it performs better. Even at that severe end, about 40% of them are ending up in landfills, as opposed to an irregular shaped building. Um, those all those very odd shapes that we see in lots of modern buildings, um, about 70% of those at that right-hand end are ending up in landfill. So when you build an irregularly shaped building, you pay quite a significant performance penalty um, for that. Regular shaped buildings are much more resilient than irregular ones. And then we can look at foundation type. So you've got here um, the, two, the two to think about is our traditional timber floor foundation. So this is what we mostly built our residential houses out of prior to maybe that 1980s. Um, and then come the 1980s and early 90s, uh, we really throughout New Zealand went to concrete slab foundations. 
So this is what Shord referred to as 3604, that's the sort of governing New Zealand standard. Um, and you can see that concrete slab foundations, when the ground liquefies, perform poorly, more poorly than our timber floors. Um, so again, you pay a penalty if you've built a concrete slab foundation and you're on a liquefiable site as opposed to timber. So what does all this mean with respect to um, carbon costs? Well, we can now build a model house. Let's make it brick clad, timber framed. It's about 150 square meters, so it's a medium sized house. It's not a large house, it's not a really small house. Um, and it's a simple shape. If that house has a timber floor, then the total carbon in that house is about 17 tons. If I give it a typical concrete slab, um, it's about 20 tons. And if I give it this TC2 waffle slab that Shord referred to, it's about 26 tons. So following the Christchurch earthquake, we recognize that when the land performs poorly, our existing foundations weren't really cutting it. We needed to build more robust foundations. A waffle slab is a more robust concrete slab foundation. It gets more robustness by putting more concrete and more steel into the foundation to make it stiffer and stronger. What does that mean from a carbon perspective? So let's let's say, for argument's sake, that that waffle slab has about the same performance as a timber floor. Um, from a building code perspective, they're, they're basically interchangeable. Um, we can use both of them on slightly sort of moderately liquefiable land. Um, so I think that's a reasonably fair assumption. What does that now mean if I take my graphs and instead of just expressing the proportion of rebuilds, I start thinking about the average carbon cost per house when I have an earthquake. This is what it looks like. I'll give you a second to try and get your head around that. Down the bottom um, in red is our timber floor. Um, you can see the average expected carbon loss per house following an earthquake um, is lower than those other two foundations. The blue one is our typical um, concrete slabs that we built throughout New Zealand prior to the Canterbury earthquakes and still build in some places. And an orange is our waffle slab. That's our more robust foundation. So we've bought more resilience. We're writing less houses off proportionally, but because we've put so much more steel and concrete into that foundation, when we do write it off, the cost of that embodied carbon is significantly higher. So there's a little bit of a challenging question here. Is solving some of our res resilience issues by putting more carbon into things, is it actually a little bit of a false economy? I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I guess I'm just asking the question. <clears throat> When we think about building shapes, um, they are as you'd expect. Our regular shape buildings in green there perform better and we lose less carbon. Um, so here's an interesting one where essentially it doesn't cost us any more carbon to build complex or simple, um, but simply changing the shape of the building, not even worrying about the materials, we get a whole lot more resilience by building more simply. And finally, looking at the carbon cost of floor area. So floor area, like I touched on before, is one of these double-edged swords. You build larger, you get less resilience, and you spend more carbon. So you can see down the bottom there, if our house is 75 or 125 square meters, the average carbon loss per house is much, much less than it is for a large house. And that's because of those two reasons. They have less carbon in them to begin with, but also being smaller, they are much more resilient. So you pay quite a significant penalty, both in performance um, and in carbon, if you have a large house. So I guess in conclusion, there's two ways that we can reduce the embodied carbon in our buildings. And the first is the obvious, just reduce the embodied carbon in the buildings. And that's often where our designers and engineers will go, trying to use um, lower carbon materials, trying to remove concrete and steel from our buildings. But sometimes that comes at a cost of less resilience. And the second way is to actually increase the resilience of our building stock. And again, often if you go to an engineer and say, I wanna increase the resilience, they will put resilience measures into the building. And often those resilience measures will look like more steel and more concrete. Gives you resilience, but you do that by spending carbon, as opposed to things like making your building smaller, where you win twice. Make a smaller building, you get more resilience, because smaller buildings just perform better, um, but you also spend a whole lot more carbon. And then finally, um, the really obvious one, if you're, you're not an engineer designing buildings, but you're thinking about this from a big picture perspective in terms of land use planning, is simply to build in better areas. If we build in better areas, then we go back to that very first graph that I showed you um, around shaking. 
And if we make most of our buildings only get shaking damage, not see these effects of liquefaction, then by and large, the effects of that damage is not a hugely um, carbon intensive exercise. And so now I'll hand over to Marge um, to take us through some of these kind of legislative controls that influence these things. Thanks, Marge. Thank you. Um, so a lot of material there for people to uh, ponder upon. I'm just going to touch on the, the regulatory environment um, and the impacts of that for climate change adaptation and mitigation. So I suppose, suppose really firstly to highlight that many elements of our regulatory and policy environment are relevant and help to enable climate change mitigation and adaptation. So they do set parameters for decisions about where we build and how we build. But also to point out that regulatory environment is changing very rapidly so that we can better address climate change and mitigation adaptation. So I'm going to briefly touch on the key provisions that are relevant to geohazards now and just highlight what some of those key changes are that are afoot. So the decision-making complex we're thinking about here is quite complex. Um, there are many factors to consider when making decisions about land use and about buildings. They're social, they're economic, they're cultural and they're environmental factors. And climate change, adaptation and mitigation are part of that big picture. They both need to be considered. And there may be some win-win outcomes, as Eric has illustrated. But however, there will be some very difficult decisions when mitigation outcomes seem to compete with adaptation outcomes, or in fact, that other range of other desirable outcomes we're after. What's important when we're facing decisions about where to build and, and what to build um, is to be aware that these decisions should be informed by sound technical information and assessment, the sort of information that um, Sean and Eric have talked about, but also that attention is paid to the context in which decisions are going to be made. So supporting decision making in the regulatory framework will be a different tests or requirements. Uh, the tests are, are different when we think about where we build, so the decisions made under the Resource Management Act, and I'll touch on three types of decisions that get made, and then also the decisions we make about where to build, what we build under the Building Act. So if we have a look at district plans and plan change, this is mostly where um, very broad planning objectives and policies about where we can build, uh, what we're going to build, where, what's going to happen in different places is set out. Um, they set out the accepted, expected environmental outcomes and results and the rules that apply. When these plans and plan changes are being considered, the evaluation that's required includes identifying and assessing the benefits and costs of the environmental, economic, social and cultural effects from those provisions. So we're thinking very broadly, broadly about benefits and costs. Also specifically to assess the risk of acting or not acting if there is uncertainty or insufficient information about the subject matter of the provisions. So here there's a lot of the technical information that's very important in informing that broader cost benefit analysis and also considering the uncertainty associated with geohazards. What's important is these plans can create new land use rights which may exist in perpetuity. So our time frame here is very long term. When we step into land use consent, so when people are applying to do something that's not provided for as permitted activity in a plan, councils are specifically required to consider the effects on the environment of significant risks from natural hazards. So geohazards are clearly for at the front here. Um, the provisions of national policy statements and, and plans um, also need to be considered. The environmental assessment that needs to accompany these applications needs to expressly consider any risk to the neighbourhood or wider community or the environment through natural hazards. Often these assessments aren't particularly comprehensive or, or very um, deep in their analysis to date. Most land use consents have no expiry date. So again, the information informing these decisions needs to be thinking about long term timeframes. Subdivision consents, there are new provisions that have been in place for, for a little while for considering subdivision consents. Councils are specifically required to think about significant risks from natural hazards and think about access, 
Um, the consents can have conditions if they're granted to address those matters. The assessment requirements are fairly, these are the new requirements, are reasonably complex. You might describe that as perhaps a committee de definition of what might need to happen. Almost everything's there. You need to think about likelihood of natural hazards occurring, either on their own or in combination with other events, material damage to the land or structures that would result from natural hazards, um, any likely subsequent use of the land, which could accelerate, worsen or result in material damage. There's no guidance yet exactly how that um, assessment should be completed and very few assessments have really addressed these requirements yet in the Act. It's important to also realise these consents have no expiry date. So once you've subdivided it, subdivided until someone amalgamates titles in some way, another legal process. So again, our time frame thinking needs to be very long, particularly when we're thinking about likely subsequent use of land. Um, so that could be something to consider well into the future. When we turn to building consents, it's a little bit more straightforward. I can see my little subdivision consent um, is hiding in the bottom in that, se <laughs> that second bullet point. Um, so building consents, compliance with the building code is what's important here. Um, you comply with regulations or acceptable solutions or some verica verification method. The design life um, is not less than 50 years of structural statements. Uh, elements um, and applies from the time of co-compliance. For some buildings and some aspects, it may be less than 50 years. So the time frame is quite short. Um, probably doesn't the design life probably doesn't necessarily align with the actual life of buildings. So we probably need to be thinking a little bit um, in the future about how long these buildings might actually be um, in place. So just touching what change is afoot. Um, about where we build. In 2020, there are amendments to the RMA that have come into effect at the end of this month. From that time, councils will now have to regard, uh, give regard to emissions reduction plans and national adaptation plans when they're amending or making plans or policy statements under the RMA. So previously, these have not, um, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions have not been needed to be considered. This requirement now aligns with the Climate Change Response Act, and we expect to see an emissions reduction plan, the first one, out in May next year, and a national adaptation plan out next year. So it's aligning these two pieces of law. There'll be some time before plans get to be modified, so we can't, won't expect to see a lot of change in the short term, but over the next year or two. They also may now consider discharges to air um, the greenhouse gas emissions, that was expressly excluded from their considerations prior to this amendment. We're also seeing some really important other changes happening. So we have a new um, national policy statement on urban development, and that's run it rolling out, um, and the Enabling Housing and Supply and Other Matters Bill, which is in the House right now. These will significantly, are looking to significantly increase building of, home, of houses. So we can see a great deal more pressure, potentially on houses being built and being needing to be really clear about where the right places to build them and with building ne new legacies of problems for the future. There's also the major resource management system reform, uh, which will significantly change the processes that were involved in the, the, the three act, new acts being proposed under that reform process. So that's going to take a little while to roll out, but we're going to see a lot more of that happening next year when the bills are introduced to Parliament. And there's change afoot um, in what we build. So MB has this Building for Climate Change program, which Eric has mentioned already, and that's specifically a big program, the once in a generation change exercise, they're calling it, um, to, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from buildings and to ensure that buildings are prepared for future effects of climate change. So clearly it's addressing mitigation of emissions, climate change, and also adaptation. That adaptation is not building in areas impacted by climate change, thinking about how to do that, and design standards that take into account future climate. I put a link to the web page where that's happening because clearly this is where the discussions and debate needs to be happening about building standards, those decisions about what timeframes we're thinking about when we're doing building designs or foundation designs. Some other drivers of change, some of you may have been aware of some of these other things. So the local government New Zealand 
has a climate change project on both adaptation and mitigation. So they're coordinating and driving a lot of the way different councils are thinking about this. We have a lot of councils and others have de declared climate emergencies um, and now being obliged to walk the talk on those declarations. And certainly for local councils, the Auditor General is focusing very closely on this when he does his normal assessment of long-term plans, the associated infrastructure plans and financial strategies to see whether councils are actually walking the talk on their climate emergency declarations. There's the carbon neutral government program, which means lots of government departments are focusing on their footprints um, for buildings and procurement. There are procurement rules and policies that central government and some other parties are rolling out. There are ministerial requests under the Climate Change Response Act to provide information to the minister on aspects of climate emissions and other matters relevant to climate change. And we have mandatory financial disclosures on climate change for a number of uh, organisations, banks, insurers, investment managers. And we have growing stakeholder, NGO, citizen and consumer pressure. So there's a lot of drive for change. All that is feeding into the kinds of programmes that MB and MFE uh, and the Climate Change Minister are working on in reforming um, and changing our regulatory settings. So we need sound information for this good, inform good decision making. So it's really important um, when we're thinking about helping to inform a good decision process to be aware of that context. So what information does the decision, decision maker need? What are they required to consider? And what other drivers may or will be impacting on their decisions? So that awareness is really important. And it will be important to think about the timeframes, the implications of future climate change over the full lifespan of the decision's impact. Um, is that a 50-year lifetime of a building or is that a hundreds and or hundreds of years impact for creating a new community? And thinking about the effectiveness of the management of design measures over that time will be an important part of good, sound decision-making information. We need to have, have some broad considerations. Think about the possible disruptors, so those stresses that we've talked about, slow rise and sea level rise and the implications of that on groundwater. The shock events, so I've talked about earthquakes particularly um, today, um, and the, the use of scenarios to consider these. So thinking about scenarios, uh, understanding what those involve, and using those to provide a range of possible futures for decision makers to be thinking about is important. And the technical information. So the technical information about the geohazards is really important. So that needs to be really clear and understandable information. Lots of decisions are made by oh, non-geotechnical engineers. Um, so the, that needs to explain the relevant, relevant geological conditions and processes the soil conditions that Schwartz referred to, and the processes, shrink swell, sea level rise change, groundwater rise change, how this may be impacted by climate change, so how those conditions change uh, when sea level rises or groundwater rises, what that might mean, what would look like for buildings, for infrastructure, other effects on the environment, e.g. landslides, rocking rivers, for example. And what measures can be taken to manage those effects? And what's their efficacy in terms of adaptation and design options and what their carbon footprints might be, mitigation? It's all that good, sound information. We need to be sure we're communicating the uncertainties and our understanding and the assumptions that are being made so that decision makers can be well informed and make a good, balanced decision. So thank you, everyone. Um, and we'll now turn back to Sean. He's going to lead us through um, response to some questions. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Marge. And thank you, Eric. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, it's uh, on the hour now. We've been an hour. For those of you who need to go, uh, thank you for joining us. For those who'd like to stay on for a few minutes for some Q&A, uh, feel free to do so. I'll start with uh, the first question that popped up. Uh, it's an interesting one. If drought lowers the groundwater levels and sea levels uh, and sea level rise will raise it, then what's the net result likely to be? Obviously, it will vary by location, but overall, it seems to suggest that the dynamics of groundwater and the ability to predict what 
it might do in the future will become more complex. Is that uh, your view? There's a lot in that question. Uh, yes, there is an awful, you know, I acknowledge that there is a lot of complexity, but, um, you know, a, a lot of these hazards, uh, our geohazards are, yeah, that have a degree of independence or mutual exclusivity to them. Soils that are subject to, you know, and, and prone to lick faction uh, near coastal areas, you know, sands and silts, are uh, far less prone to soil uh, shrink swell just by the nature of the soils that they are. And, uh, you know, compared to uh, clays. Uh, secondly, so the, um, uh, you know, when we get far enough inland away from the effects of, uh, you know, the sea, uh, groundwater is not controlled by uh, sea level, uh, you know, in those areas, and therefore they are nicely independent. Um, but when it comes to drought, uh, you know, an earthquake can come in a year of a drought. An earthquake can come in a year when the groundwater levels are higher. Years of drought can damage buildings, causing the ground to shrink and swell. Earthquakes can come along at any time. So we would take the median groundwater level sort of uh, as, a, as a point for designing, uh, you know, for assessing the geohazards from earthquakes. And therefore, overall, if we don't expect sort of a long-term uh, change in, the, you know, or, or if there's going to be a long-term change in the median groundwater level, that's what one would take into account for the geohazards from earthquakes, which would be independent of what might happen in one-off, you know, or, or just, you know, during dry spells. So they aren't necessarily opposing one another. Eric, there's a good question for you. Uh, someone was wondering if simple building shapes perform better, why are all of our new houses shaped so irregularly? Yeah, um, I think the simple answer to that is because we haven't thought about it. We haven't thought about the effect of building regularity shape on performance. Uh, we have a great data set in the Canterbury and Kaikoura claims data that mean we can actually interrogate those types of relationships. Um, and understand the impact that the shape of a building actually has on its performance. I guess the things that have led to buildings being made um, progressively more irregular over time, because it's actually an age thing, um, is the way that we now build subdivisions. So we don't like straight streets with rectangular sections. Um, we don't put a standard rectangle or square at the front of that and have a garage at the back. That's not the way we build anymore. Um, so the, the way we subdivide and develop land um, has influenced the shape of our residential houses and also the way that we do construction these days. So now we do a lot of off-site frame and truss manufacture. So, so the, um, the the bones of a building are actually built off-site. Um, so that means complex shapes aren't challenging. They used to be to a, an individual builder on a site who had to do all the trigonometry on site. Um, nowadays, it's all built in a factory. Um, so the builder doesn't have to wrestle with complex angles particularly on a site because the, the structure of the building is actually built off site and delivered to site. So that all of those things have enabled us to build much more complex shaped buildings. And I think um, some of what we saw in Christchurch and suburbs like Bexley, where a lot of those new houses um, existed, uh, we, we reaped the, I'm not going to say rewards, uh, the downsides of all of those decisions. Thank you, Eric. And uh, certainly for the future, that is an easy one to control, isn't it? To, to buy, get get ourselves better resilience, and and as a result, re also reduce our carbon footprint. That's right. Yep. Okay, Marge, a question for you: uh, What are some of the most important things that the reform process will need to do if we really do want to address climate change? Thanks, Sean. And I suppose a couple of those things have been highlighted already. Um, so first, we've got to think about the future, well into the future. Think about the timeframes of the impact of the decisions that we're, being, we're making, whether that's a strategic plan, a spatial plan, a resource management plan, or what we call a built environment plan, um, resource consent or building consent. We need to be thinking much more about what, what could happen in the future. Thinking about scenarios. Uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty, and so different things could happen at different times and a different different rate of change. And the other really important thing will be being able to 
deal with and use good information and recognize we're going to have new information all the time um, and be able to use the new information, the new research to inform our decisions. Now, we, we tend to do a little bit of exercise with gathering information and we make a plan and then it's set in stone for quite a long time and we challenge it through consent processes. So thinking long term, thinking about um, how the information we'll have during the time frame of a plan um, is going to change and we need to be able to bring that new information um, into our decision making in a way that's transparent and people will trust. Those are the important things I would see need to happen. Great, thank you Marge. Right, I think we will wrap it up there. So thank you very much Marge and Eric and thank you everyone for uh, taking some time out of your day to join this webinar. Uh, uh, information about uh, you know about this and a recording is going to be available and uh, if, if you have any further questions do uh, email any of the presenters and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, with that, thank you very much and have a good day.